Okay, we're live. You all know the drill. Let we're going to let this stream breathe just for a few minutes. Well, not minutes, seconds. Make sure it's nice and stable. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle. It's powered by Overtime Media, and I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, as always, my partner in crime, my fellow football priest. You know him. You love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach. We're going to go through the news, the latest on DeMar Dotson. We're going to get to the parameters of this deal that is reportedly in place, and we'll get to all that. But really what has predominated the news cycle on Sunday, on today, for those of you listening after the fact, Sunday, is this unfortunate momentum that seems to have built up that the college football season is going to be canceled, in effect. Postponed is the verbiage they're using until 2021, which – you know, neither one of us are huge college guys. It's going to absolutely crush the draft industry. It's going to crush the draft content creators. It's going to definitely put a wrinkle in, uh, you know, the, the the fall planning of guys like Eric Trickle and Nick Kendall and Carl Dummler and our draft experts here at MHH. But it's going to have some pretty far-reaching ramifications, I would think, Zach, on the 2021 NFL draft. Yeah, I don't want to come off ignorant. I can't say I follow college football like a hardcore fan, but it seems like every major conference is governed by their own rules. I mean, from what I learned last time, the SEC wants to play this fall. They're not going to mm -hmm. lose out on the revenue. They're going to follow the NFL's model of trying to salvage as much money this season as possible. The ACC, the big conferences like that, the Big Ten, the smaller ones, though, they're in danger. I, I feel like a lot of the smaller conferences, like the Patriot League or whatever it is, they've already canceled, and, and they're going to fall in line with that. But the bigger guys, I still think, Chad, considering how well the NFL has also contained CV, there's been less and less uh, positive results, less and less people going on these lists. If the SEC sees that, that NFL, their plan to combat CV works, they're not going to lose out on the revenue. The, C the SEC – Prince Cash. It is a major, major, major business. And people want to watch football this fall. And they know that. Now, the student athletes, there's more to it than an NFL player. They have, you know, their schooling, they have whether they want to declare for the draft, they have their careers to plan and their lives to plan and their kids. It's different than grown men mm -hmm. and millionaires NFL players. So I don't know what they're going to do on a case by case basis. But right now, my gut tells me the SEC is going nowhere. And I'd be surprised if the ACC cancels football this fall as well it really is frustrating it's something i you know i was trying to convey to fans way back when we were still in the grip of the nationwide lockdown and that is that while i maintained an optimistic point of view on the nfl season happening what worried me about college is how it's got one foot in basically kind of a pro a, a revenue oriented football league and one foot in education and as everyone knows who pays attention to the news, right, or is a parent, right now, one of the predominant storylines in the United States is whether or not different schools or different states, I should say, are going to even allow school to happen in person. And that trickles down and affects, of course, NCAA, colleges, universities. And so it's not just a purely revenue based decision in terms of, you know, weighing the risks. There are also the politics of what's going on in the educational realm. And it's really unfortunate because the reality is from what we've seen on the data, college age students and, you know, world-class level athletes, Zach, I mean, they're not the high risk contingent, right. not the high risk demographic in the United States. So I feel like you, as the NFL is showing here where there's a will, there's a way. And I just, it's just unfortunate to see that in, in the NCAA, it doesn't appear as if the will exists. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it all comes down to money, Chad, but the the NCAA has to weigh the student athletes and their health and, and, and their future outlook. And it's tough because some of these colleges aren't having even in-house lectures and in-house classrooms or having distance learning and virtual learning. So how are you going to have congregation of players in one area without the threat of spreading CV? How are you going to have a locker room full of 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds? How are you going to tell them you can't go out on your off night? You can't go to a bar right. in a college town. It's impossible. So that's why it's harder for uh, these student athletes to you know, play football this fall as opposed to NFL players when I feel like the 25, 30-year-olds have more responsibility. They have families. They've settled down. 
Try to tell an 18 year old though, you can't go out for six months. You have to be in, you know, in quarantine. You have to be isolated. They don't want to hear that. If they're not going to be on campus, they at least want to live their lives. It, it's stubborn. It, it's it's unfortunate in some areas, Chad. The pockets that have surging cases, but that's the reality. And you, anyone is naive to think otherwise. That's a fair point. In the NFL, as we know, they have some pretty. First of all, these are full grown men. There's big time dollars personally at stake for the players on the college. And there's some pretty significant sanctions, heavy handed sanctions that the NFL right. has agreed to and put in place, or I should say the NFL PA has agreed to and allowed to go in place as an amendment to the CBA for pro players who decide to participate in anything that the CBA deems as high risk behavior with regard to CB. That's a fair point, And I'm not sure that there is a common sense solution, at least on the surface in terms of you got college age kids, athletes, hormones are raging, running and gunning, famous stars on their campus, and they're going to want to go out and, and do their thing. And that makes it very difficult in terms of disease and infection prevention. So it's unfortunate. It's a, I still think if there was, if there was a concerted effort amongst all the different conferences to unite and figure out some kind of a potential solution yep. in the same way that the NFL and other pro leagues have I think there would be a solution, but the will, I just don't think it's there. I think these, these conferences and the NCAA at, at large is basically resigned to kicking the can down the road and, you know, we'll kind of reconvene and figure it out in 2021. But for the NFL and for fans of the Denver Broncos, Zach, all appearances are the season is going to happen on schedule. At least it's going to yes. start on schedule. That we can say for sure. We know that there will be games week one of the NFL it will be interesting and remains to be seen whether or not week two goes off without a hitch and on schedule. We'll, we'll get to all that. Yeah, we can hope for now, Chad, but we, the NFL, like I said, they, I didn't like how they waited so long to come up with a plan, but the plans that teams have come up with, including the Broncos have really curtailed the spread of CV in locker rooms. And so far training camp, Chad, it, it's weird. It's limited. It, it's not what you'd expect from early August, but at least it's going on right now. And all indications are um, there's no major outbreaks, no major surge in cases. We are going to have a season. I can't speak to college football, though I'd be shocked if the SEC doesn't play this fall. They are the most uh, comparable to the NFL. The NFL is going forward. They're not going to want to lose any sort of revenue if they can prevent it, Chad. It will be interesting to see how it all shakes out. The last thing SI, Sports Illustrated, has reported on it is that Quote, high-level conference meetings are being planned for this week across the college football landscape with the expected resolution of postponing fall sports until 2021, multiple sources have told SI. So we will see how it shakes out. But tonight, gang, we are focused on, of course, your Denver Broncos, and specifically we're focused on DeMar Dotson, the free agent offensive tackle that the team has is bringing in for a look-see, more than a look-see, in terms of stopping the gap in this massive hole that was created by Jawan James choosing to go on sabbatical. We're going to get to that here in just a few minutes. First, a couple of really quick matters of business. Gang, make sure you're following the podcast on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. That's how you become, uh, how you keep your finger, I guess, is the best way to say it, on, your, on the pulse of the Huddle Up podcast and what's happening in real time. While you're at it, also make sure you're following the main account, the mother account, at Mile High Huddle. You have those two boxes checked, so to speak. You're not going to miss anything important as it relates to your team, the Denver Broncos. And, gang, we want to gently draw your attention to the merch store, huddleuppod.com. Head on over there if you're in a position to and get your swag on. Get yourself one of these football priest hats. There are T-shirts. Zach just designed this new – in fact, I should probably show you guys this thing if you hit, if in case you've missed it. Zach just designed a brand-new T-shirt – let them hate. It has been the number one bestseller on the merch store since we debuted it. I want to say about a week or so back. I'll show this to you real quick. It is really nice. We've had a few of our great community members reach out and send us some selfies once they receive their gear and they look really nice. So as you can see here, let them hate. And then on the back, you have got the Locked in hashtag in the Huddle Up podcast logo. That's one of many options, including face masks and other things. It's another way that you can support what we're doing here at Mile High Huddle. Get your swag on. And if you're not in a position to do something like that, it's all good. These three things each one of you can help us with, whether you're with us live in the chat stream now 
or listening after the fact on demand as a podcast episode, make sure you're subscribed, number one. Number two, like this video or like this podcast episode. And if you really love what Zach and I are doing for you, and we don't just say this, this is a, this is really key and really important. Share it out there. Help MHH, help the Huddle Up podcast continue to grow by exposing this content to your friends and, and family who are like-minded Broncos fans. And then one last thing, Zach, and then we'll get into the crux of tonight's podcast. Want to also draw your attention to our Facebook audience. Guys, we love you. We've been trying to find ways that, uh, I mean, inundated ever since we started doing these consistent daily live streams from our Facebook audience since we've been streaming to Facebook on each and every one of these podcasts. How do we support what you guys are doing at MHH? Zach, I could say probably maybe not quite half, but I would say about a quarter of our Super Chat superstars, and many of whom are MHH Mount Rushmore's just absolute superstars, started out on Facebook, wanted to find a way to support what we're doing, and went over to YouTube in order to donate and become superstars, Super Chat superstars. There is now a way on Facebook that you can support what we're doing. It's by becoming an official supporter. It's something that Facebook recently debuted, and we have now access to that at MHH. So I just put the link in the chat stream. If that's something you want to check out on Facebook, by all means, we appreciate it. All right, Zach, I want to get to the main talking points for today, and then we'll see what's on everybody's mind in the chat stream and welcome in everybody who've been hanging out in the room and are with us here early. We've got a good solid uh, group here. And of course, all the familiar faces. I want to talk to you, Zach, about the news. So obviously, yesterday, we learned on Saturday, that the Denver Broncos were bringing in a name that you have floated as a potential free agent solution to the right tackle hole that has been created with Juwan James opting out. And that is DeMar Dotson has, was uh, brought in or is being brought in for a look-see as a potential fill-in, compete with Elijah Wilkinson for the right tackle position. But there's a couple of hurdles, one of which, of course, is par for the course for each and every free agent deal. you got to pass a physical. But he's also got to pass the two-stage CV testing protocol, which also includes Zach ostensibly, if it's going to be the same way that the signed players did it anyway, uh, self-quarantine, which could take a little time. So instead of this being a quick turnaround, you know, probably – you have a resolution within 24 hour window. This might be something where who knows, maybe they do the physical first and then have them do the CV. And if everything's good on the, on the physical, they just go ahead and sign the deal and then wait to bring him into the fold once he passes. But the latest news on this Zach is from Mike Cliss who says, quote, and I'll show you guys this real quick. It's I think it's, it adds to what we're doing here when you guys can see what we're reading. Let me pull it up real quick here. As you can see here from Cliss, this is Sunday afternoon quote, Parameters of a deal in place with DeMar Do uh, Dotson, but still not done. The expectation, though, is that Dotson will be a Bronco by early in the week pending virus testing and a physical. What's your gut reaction to the Broncos <sighs> getting this deal done? Well, I appreciate you listening to the podcast, John, because we talked about him on Thursday and then they bring him in the next day. Uh, my next reaction was, Woohoo! Thank God, Chad. It took six months, but the Broncos finally signed some veteran insurance behind Juwan James, who's not on the team anymore for this season, and Garrett Bowles. They're not having to rely on Elijah Wilkinson, who's not a natural tackle, who's coming off surgery. I really like this pickup. You don't have to feel the pressure to start him. He has 120 appearances under his belt. This guy is a gamer. This guy has skin in the NFL. He's a great veteran addition at this stage of the offseason. A former longtime starter, one of the best right tackles when he's consistent in the NFL. I'm not saying he's, you know, Eric Schwartz or anything like Eric Fisher. I think he's very consistent, though, and he's better than anything the Broncos have had on that side, Juwan James included in the last several years. I think it was a great pickup at this stage, Chad. And if he ends up starting, it could be a lot worse. Anything is better than Elijah Wilkinson. I agree. There is one thing that's concerning to me. I'm going to get to that here in just one second. Once Now that I've done my, my research on DeMar Dotson. Duke Boynton, though, I want to grab this awesome super chat. Appreciate you, my friend, as <laughs> always. Cool. He says, I'm getting my 19-year-old daughter the hashtag let him hate shirt. She loves it. That's great to hear, Duke, and give our best to your family who are obviously like their old man, very passionate and outgoing Broncos fans. So give our best. And if you want to put their names in here, we're happy to shout them out. Zach, 
what really concerns me is this little detail here. So Elijah Wilkinson, last year in 12 starts, produced, well, relinquished 10 sacks and was flagged six times for on penalties. Two of them were false starts, four of them were holds. Dotson, as you mentioned, he's 34. He started 15 games last year at right tackle for the Bucs. He's an eight-year starter, which means he has been the starting right tackle in Tampa Bay for the previous eight seasons. He's a free agent now, and I think this is the reason why. Even though PFF had him graded as the number 31 uh, tackle amongst qualifying tackles with a 71.0 grade, he actually gave up. This is what I want to show people here. Uh, right here, he was penalized a whopping 10 times last year, which is approaching Garrett Bowles' levels in terms of just way too much. Five false starts, five holding penalties. That's not a deal breaker to me, Zach, especially when you compare that Wilkinson's cumulative grade last year from PFF was under 60. You have Dotson at 71, which, you know, we we sometimes clown and PFF's grading system, they can seem arbitrary. We tend to take them for the most part with a grain of salt in terms of the grades, some of their advanced analytics and actual metrics that you can measure on the field objectively. Those are, those are useful and can tell us a lot. Sometimes the grades are helpful in at least kind of being a little bit of a barometer, but they are by no means Bible. They are by no means right. foolproof and just fail safe. But it can kind of paint the picture of in terms of you know ranking where these guys are. I don't know. Talking to the guys who've watched a lot of film, the MHH guys who've watched a lot of film on Dotson, he's really good as a pass blocker, leaves a little bit to be desired as a run blocker. But I am worried a little bit, Zach, that at 34 and having been in the league since 2009 – that he's still kind of presenting recidivist type flags, you know, five false starts, five holding fouls. I can't excuse the false starts because that's a mental discipline issue, Chad. But if Garrett Bowles gets excused for his holding penalties because of the quarterback, why not DeMar Dotson? His quarterback was Jameis Winston, and he's entertaining to watch and all. He's, you know, he can make some exciting plays, but he's an idiot as far as quarterbacks go. He threw 30 interceptions last season. It's hard to protect that kind of quarterback. I, I would not be surprised if a lot of his holding penalties, which I'm not excusing completely, were because Jameis Winston was doing something in the pocket, trying to escape. All I'm saying is if Garrett Bowles gets that excuse, then DeMar Dotson gets that excuse as well. They don't need a Hall of Famer on that right side. They need consistency. And if they're worried about run blocking, guess who they signed this offseason to help out at tight end? Nick Vanette. Put him on the right side if you want to run and if you're worried about the, uh, the blocking from DeMar Dotson. I'm more concerned with pass blocking. You saw Elijah Wilkinson last year try to protect, keyword try, Drew Locke. It was a disaster. I have a video on my Twitter that proves that. He, his specialty, DeMar Dotson, is pass blocking. You're trying to protect and harbor and encourage and support your franchise quarterback. And you do that by bringing in an eight-time, eight-year starter who's really good at pass blocking, who is a serviceable starter who might not even start this season. Maybe it pushes Wilkinson to be better. Maybe Jake Rogers steps up. Maybe Calvin Anderson steps up. But at least you have Dotson in the system. At least you can fall back on having someone like that. And yet his age, he's not the long-term option. He has some false start issues. He's not perfect, but he's a lot better than Donald Stevenson, than Menelik Watson, than Juwan James. And you could do a lot worse on August 10th going forward, picking up a guy like this, to protect your franchise quarterback and your young offense. I like this move a lot. Dude, technically he's more proven than any of those names, including Juwan James. Yep. I mean, he's an eight-year starter. Now, Juwan James came to the Denver Broncos after five years as a Dolphin, and, you know, he had some serious experience as an NFL tackle. But DeMar Dotson's an eight-year starter. And honestly, I, one of the things that I kind of chalk up those those ten fouls to, those, and by the way, thanks, Chris, for reminding everybody, yeah. click those little thumbs up. And by the way, been a while since we've seen our boy Bronx Legends. Good to see you, my friend. Welcome into the stream. It's not the same without you, dog. So thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, but what I was going to say is, you know, when you when your quarterback is Jameis Winston, who let's face it, he makes a lot of he, last year in Tampa. He made some very questionable decisions, and I'm not talking about throwing picks, but just get rid of the ball, man. If you, it, right. it's one of those situations where the tackles can get put in really unfortunate situations where it's either let my quarterback get killed or go ahead and hold this dude or tackle this dude. And 
you know, they have to walk that razor's edge at times. And I at least partially attribute Zach so many of those holding fouls to the, and and false starts not aren't necessarily due to to Jameis Winston, but the holding penalties. I wonder how much that yeah. might have to do with it anyway. Uh, Josh jumping in, appreciate that super you, as Josh. always, my friend. You to man, he says, "What's up? The Broncos are gonna whoop up on the Titans in Week One." <laughs> Hey, man, I love it. We're hoping so. We're hoping the Broncos start off with an authoritative victory on Monday Night Football, the second and final um, Monday Night Football game to open this season. Bronx legend, appreciate you, my friend. A real pod indeed. Yeah, we have missed you. As the as the community is letting you know right now, it's been a minute, and it's good to have you back in the saddle with us. Whoops. John, the stream just did a massive jump on me. I got to see what I can catch up to. Bear with us one sec here, guys. Nope, I think I think we're good. Oh, and here he is showing love. Yeah, He's in the stream the first time in a long time, and yet he comes in, supports the channel, supports MHH, supports these podcasts, as he has always done. So thank, thank you, you my friend. It's good to have you, and it's just not the same without you, dog. But uh, how much – Zach, in your mind, is that making a mountain out of a molehill, the the 10 penalties last year, considering, I mean, Broncos fans, look, everyone focused mostly on Garrett Bowles when it came to the to the holding penalties and the, and the draw on the yellow laundry, and he was the guy that everyone was throwing the darts at, understandably so. But I think most fans can remember how often Elijah Wilkinson got penalized last year. Dotson penalized almost twice as many. How much is that of that is a concern to you, even understanding that, I agree with you perfectly that he's he's solid help to an offensive tackle depth chart that is just devoid of anything remotely uh, proven in terms of talent. Besides Garrett Bowles, you can say proven, you know, three-year starter at least. After him, it's a massive drop-off. Like I said, if Bowles has that alibi, chat of if the quarterback makes him worse, then why doesn't DeMar Dotson? Jameis, he's, he's only experienced pretty much the last several seasons of Jameis Winston. They had Ryan Fitzpatrick. He hasn't exactly been working with all-star quarterbacks. Um, and what was his ranking that you said, number 31? 31, yeah. Out of how many tackles? Uh, it's 70? In, uh, it's in the 70s, I want to that, say, something like that. So he's in the upper half of the NFL tackles, yeah. and you're getting him on the open market for a probably close to the veterans minimum or not much more than that. It's not a multi-year contract. It's not going to sink the salary cap. And they had so much money to play around with, Chad, after James opted out. It was irresponsible to not bring in a tackle, only having Elijah Wilkinson on the depth chart right now. I, mean, I don't think it's – I'm not worried about his penalties because, again, he's not the long-term answer. He's a bandit at, at that position. And he's exactly what you need right now because you have some young guys you're excited about. You have Mike Munchak getting his hooks on these guys. And DeMar Dawson is just that that fail safe. He's that, you know, he's that umbrella underneath you. He's that net underneath you that if yeah. anything happens, if anything goes wrong, at least you can rely on him. And having the number 31 tackle as your fail safe, you could do a lot worse than that, Chad. Buona Beast brings up a good question. What is your grade? If Dotson is signed as far as grading the move, he says solid B for me. Uh, I would give it a B. I would give it a B. What would you say? I got to see the contract. If they overpay for him like they did, you know, Juwan James, I'm not going to like it that much. But, you know, they had to bring in a veteran guy. As long as the money's relatively decent, it's an A minus for me. You had to make the move. And I like him more than Donald Penn. I like him more than Cordy Glenn. I think he fits the system really well, and he's going to surprise a lot of Broncos fans. Mundungus, the wizard himself, has returned, and it's good to have you back in the stream, my friend. Really appreciate that generous super Thank chat. You, Mundungus. He says, just put Democrats and Republicans in charge of the NCAA. We'll always have football then because then no one will know what in God's name is going on, and nothing will get done. Hmm, sounds like the Chargers franchise. <laughs> Very true, and yes, it is, I mean – Washington feels like um, nowadays, especially you could, you could argue it's always been this way, but especially now Washington feels like a constant stalemate, you know, I mean, it's just constant gears coming to a screeching halt and it took a literal pandemic with tens of millions of Americans on the verge of potentially starvation, potentially not, you know, many, many millions not being able to pay bills. It took that for Congress, both both sides of the aisle, to get together and, and put together the care package. And now that that many of those benefits have expired for people at the end of July, indeed, it's not they're not moving the needle as far as what they're not doing their jobs that they're elected to do at Congress right now. So yeah. I hear you on that, Mundungus, and uh, we'll uh, 
we'll see how it shakes out with the NCAA. Zeus McPeak Zeus. jumping in, Zach. And he has made his transition from the Pacific Northwest to Texas. And it sounds like you made it there safe and sound. Good. Zeus, we love you, my friend. Thanks for everything you do for the show. Thank you. Zeus, you, always. You, you demand. That's right. Um, which reminds me, I was going to show the swag Stu sent, but I think I have it in another room. Well, I'll, I'll remember to bring it in so we can show everybody what he sent us tomorrow. Um, but he, uh, very thoughtful. Appreciate that, my brother. All right, let's see what else we've got here. We got Bronco Batman. Also, a, a fellow that became very active in the community, very active on Super Chat, kind of, and I understand it, when the draft is over and free agency is in the books and you've got a long pandemic summer, it's easy to kind of turn away. But Bronco Batman with the season, we're on the doorstep of the season. He's back in the saddle. And it's good to have you back, bro. He says, yep. so happy to see practice going. The season is almost here. Amen to that, Zach. I mean, it's yeah. not quite the same in terms of the format at training camp, but it is good to know. Like yesterday was their first day off since training camp officially opened, and they're back in the saddle working again today. And it's just good to know. It's encouraging to know that the, the they're at the building and football is happening. It's what, like four or five weeks away. It's not that far from now. I mean, it's right around the corner and we'll have more of a normal training camp after the 17th when the Broncos have their first padded practice. But until then, like the comment said, it's so nice to have football back. Training camps are underway. Everyone's back in the building, getting the highlights chat of Drew Locke throwing to his receivers in an official setting. Very exciting. I'm so happy football season is almost here. Gang, we're going to be giving away, as you guys know, it is Sunday, and we're, we're turning this into a tradition here on the Huddle Up podcast. We're going to be giving away some swag tonight, and we're going to randomly select someone who is active in the chat stream. So just keep that in mind. We'll be announcing the winner here toward the end of the show. It's going to be the Let Them Hate shirt is what we're going to be sending out to you. So we shall see who wins that. John Buonabeast has the old internet machine open and ready to draw a name randomly. But Mundunga says, I got to say, even with Wilkinson at right tackle, I'm not really changing my win versus loss estimate. I still think the Broncos will end 11 and 5 or 12 and 4, which is obviously very optimistic and pretty close yeah. to my way too early prediction for this team that I unveiled. I don't know what it was to, well, right after the draft, I guess, of 11 and 5. Yeah, 12 and 4. I'm high on the Broncos this year. It's a little too high for me. 11 and 5, I can see if the stars align. I'm, you know, still rolling with Wilkinson or not, you know, Wilkinson or Dotson. I'm saying 10 and 6. Double digit win team, playoff team, back on the national landscape, back on the NFL relevancy map. I think it's going to happen this year. You never know, though. I mean, 12 and 4, Chad, crazier things have happened. Look at the Ravens last year. Look at Patrick Mahomes in his first season as a starter. If Locke has that type of influence and impact, 12 and 4 is a possibility. Josh Alstrom jumping back in on Super Chat, showing Thank you, great generosity. We appreciate you, my friend. He says, for Drew Locke, I think interior pressure is the big bugaboo. Not saying we don't need good tackles, but he was rolling out back and to his left every play because the right guard position getting pushed back into the QB, which we fixed. Excellent point. He had uh, a tendency to drift a little bit. Ronald Leary was an extreme – you know, when he was on the field for the most part, those first two years he was in Denver, so 2017 and 2018, when he was on the field, he mostly provided not just really great leadership and tangibles, but actual production at right guard. Last year when he was on the field, man, it was not pretty at yeah. all. And so, yes, the Bronco did, uh, Broncos did fix that, Zach, by bringing in Graham Glasgow. And this is exactly why I did not want Reisner to play tackle. I don't want I don't want to upset what the Broncos are building at guard because it is important. A lot of pressure is interior, and for a lot a quarterback like Drew Locke, who who kind of drifts back and he has unconventional deliveries and he kind of plays backyard football at times. You want your interior to be solidified. It wasn't just the tackles. So the Broncos they kept Reisner at guard. They got Glasgow, who is a massive up upgrade on Leary, and they have Demar Dotson now, who is theoretically an upgrade on on Juwan James. If all again, it all comes down to Garrett Bowles. If he is just average, this offensive line can be top 12. It can be very good. This question here from Sebastian. He wants to know how much cap space do the Broncos have? According to Over the Cap, 
They are the one, two, three, four, five, sixth most cap space currently. This is shedding the 13 million in, in cap hit of Juwan James, which will be deferred until 2021. So that comes off the books, leaving the Broncos with 29.651 million in cap space. So they have room, Zach, with which to negotiate with a guy like DeMar Dotson, a little Evan Mathis money, if you will. But at the same time, as fans, I wouldn't get your hopes up too much in terms of them going out and spending that money in one fell swoop because the salary cap can go down no further than 175, 175 million next year. And if that's the case with just the contracts that are on the books today and some of the extensions that could be coming up or re-signings, I should say, like with yep. Justin Simmons, we'll see what happens with Garrett Bowles. We'll see what happens with, I guess, Cortland Sutton could hold out next summer. There are some future considerations to keep in mind that don't even really have anything to do with potential revenue drops this year due to CV. So the number's 20, just, just over $29 million in cap space, Zach, but – don't expect the Broncos, I'm saying, to go out splurging that money. It's not a traditional year to be spending that coin. I'm anticipating the Broncos, if they do sign DeMar Dotson, that's the last move they're going to make for a while. Like you mentioned perfectly, Chad, they have to put money aside for the revenue loss. They have to prepare for that. They have a lot of in-house players. A, a chunk of their money next offseason is going to go to in-house guys, extensions. Justin Simmons, Philip Lindsay, maybe Cortland Sutton. They have a lot of guys that they have to take care of, maybe A.J. Johnson. So they're going to roll over a chunk, a majority of this money. I wouldn't look for a cornerback. I heard that's been bandied about, a quarterback coming in or a safety coming in. I wouldn't look for that to happen. If they sign Dotson, it's probably the last out-of-house guy they're going to bring in for the next couple months. We got Ron Joe, 27, showing some love on Super Chat. Thank Appreciate you. you, my friend. He says, hey, guys, hope all is well. Love what I'm hearing about Locke. It appears he is the leader. We need hashtag State of mind, which of course he's trying to say state of being. It's all good, my friend. We we know where your heart is at on that. <laughs> it's and the hashtag, Broncos nation of hashtags. Exactly. <laughs> Love my Broncos. Hey, dude, he's got a good point, though. I had an article yesterday. In fact, let me pull this up. I'll give you guys the gist. It is basically the impression that Drew Locke is making turning heads as the official number one quarterback at Broncos camp because even though Drew Locke is now entering what is his second training camp as, as an NFL, as a pro, it's his first as the guy, right? As the number one guy taking reps, first team offense, being the guy everyone looks to. And there have been, there. I mean, almost everybody with the exception of maybe Justin Simmons off the top of my head that has had media availability, coaches, so Fangio and players, have mentioned Drew Locke and they've said quite a bit about him. So undoubtedly, and I could we could go through some of the quotes. We'll see what the rest of tonight brings up. But long story short, his teammates so far are liking what they're seeing from him as the guy, as the QB one. You know, he's he's galvanizing the guys around him, and it seems to be he seems to be having a positive effect on the team. You know, it's easy for a quarterback, a young, impressionable, kind of hotshot quarterback to get complacent when he sees the teams going out of their way to build around him. He could have said, you know what? I have job security. They're not going to replace me. I can kick my feet back. But he's done the opposite. Whether it's reaching out to Peyton Manning, setting up informal throwing sessions, galvanizing the locker room, marching with his teammates, Chad, for Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's literally been the forefront of Denver football for the last six, seven, eight months. And that's what you love to see from a quarterback. He lives, eats, breathes, and sleeps Broncos football. And we haven't had a quarterback like that since Peyton Manning. And that's why it's so exciting to draw those parallels. That's why the hype for Drew Locke is legitimate. And now he has to he knows he has to that has to translate from hype to production on the field. And I would I'm not going to put it past him for that to happen. Something actually that I had a DM conversation with Christy about yesterday and a little bit this morning about Drew Locke, something she brought up, that the it factor that he brings to the table, which is absolutely true. Drew Locke has that, and Elway's referred to it as that it factor as well, the ability to be that tide that raises all ships. Now, look, it was a five-game sample size. He still has to get out there and prove a heck of a lot more. He doesn't get a bust in Canton based off five right. games as a rookie. And in fact, there are some concerning aspects to what he showed last year that I'm hopeful guys like Pat Shermer, Mike Shula are going to be able to help him smooth out and overcome 
in year two and really his first year as the guy, as a first year starter. In fact, there was a video, Zach, I don't know if you saw this yourself, but Brett Coleman does a good job on YouTube as a film guy, has a pretty good following. I want to say something like a quarter of a million subscribers on YouTube, does a really good job, very comprehensive, very knowledgeable, skilled film analyst, football analyst. And he had a, basically the premise of his video was, is Drew Locke a good quarterback? And he went back over the film and he loved Locke's first two games, which of course included both of which he threw at least two touchdowns, two against the Chargers to open up his career. And then of course, three against the Texans the next week on the road. And then he kind of went into what Coleman described a little bit as kind of a shell. And he feels like there was a watershed moment later in that Texans game where he almost got picked off that caused Locke to kind of batten down the hatches I'm not sure that Coleman's correct on that for the rest of the season, by the way. I'm not sure that he's 100% correct on that, but he did seem to be a lot more conservative in those final three games, especially after the beating he took in that Chiefs game. I'll say the final two games, he seemed a little bit more conservative. But, Zach, I think that's more attributable to the fact that Rich Scangarello was coaching him to not screw up. You know, he was right. he was coaching him more through a conservative lens and I think that's something that affects any young quarterback, which if you're Pat Shermer and you're Mike Shula, sure, you want to coach them to not give up the farm every time they throw a pass. But at the same time, you don't you don't want to completely disincentivize them from pushing the ball down the field. And by the way, Terry Randall jumping in. Appreciate that super chat, my brother. He says Thank the you. countdown begins to the regular season opener. Hashtag football priest. Hashtag state of being. You have a gunslinging quarterback, Chad, who has that mentality, who's completely raw coming out of Missouri. And then he spent – However many weeks it was, 13 weeks on IR, he's completely cold coming off the bench into the starting lineup with less of a supporting cast than he has now, less protection, uh, weaker coaching. I've watched that Texans game probably four times now, the highlights of that game and his passes. I didn't see someone who went into a shell. I didn't see someone who got mentally weak and soft like Paxton Lynch when he hit adversity. In fact, in that Chiefs game, which was his worst game of the five, he came back the next week and lit up Oakland, relatively speaking. That's what you want to see. You want to see how he battles adversity. And yeah, it might happen in the game where he throws a bad pass and he might start to overthink or press. He's a young quarterback. Mistakes are going to happen. But I would not hold how – it's amazing how well they played in that game. And to say that he went into a shell is nitpicking. That was his finest performance and the Broncos' finest performance in a pretty awful season until he came along. So I, I'm not worried about one mistake or one errant pass or, or one mental deficiency like you said, Chad. The coaching made all the difference. And having Pat Shermer, a quarterback whisperer, having Mike Shula, and Locke having that confidence after five starts. He can go back and watch the tape. He's not the same quarterback. This is a guy who in the preseason did not know how to break a huddle. He had to go in the mirror and, and recite the plays to himself. And he went on to win four out of five games at the end of his rookie season, coming off cold off IR. I am not worried about Drew Locke at all, Coleman's opinion or not. We got James Campbell jumping in real quick with a good point here. And by the way, congrats to James who published his first article at MHH this past week. Nice. It was a kind of a pound of the table for Riley Reef, Rife, Riley Reef, however you say his name, tr for the Broncos to trade for uh, acquire him via trade with the Vikings. Doesn't sound like that's the direction they're going, but it was a well written, well reasoned, excellent article. Hopefully, most of you read that. Congrats to you, James, on your kind of popping your cherry as it were. He says here, though, that cutting Juwan James in 2021, this is why it's not going to happen, would carry a dead cap hit of $19 million versus a base salary and prorated signing bonus of $12.85 million. A post-June 1st cut would not free up anything either. Gang, unless the Broncos would find a willing trade partner, which fat chance with that contract and the fact that he's not played football for two years by the time you get there, he's a Bronco next year. They're not going to move on from him get used to it, put it in. I wouldn't say Sharpie because with James, you never know what's possible, what's <laughs> going to happen. Um, but he's going to at least be on the Broncos books next year. There's no getting around that. They might want to cut him, but they probably can't cut him, especially if they're going to lose revenue this season. He's going to be the starting tackle. But like you said, Chad, we don't know anything. We don't know if he's going to be available, if he wants to play at all. We never know where Juwan James' head is at. Um, DeMar Dotson is a one-year Band-Aid to get to next year, though I'd be shocked. Juan James on the roster or not, if they don't use a high ground draft pick on a tackle, they cannot allow him to be the only tackle and be in the same position they were in this past off season. Chris Hernandez jumping in, showing us some love. One of our superstars. Appreciate you, my brother. Very Thank generous. You, 
He says, I got my Let Them Hate shirt yesterday and can't wait nice. to rep it. Very nice. We appreciate that, Chris. Make sure you send us a, a selfie and we'll shout you out on, on social, on Instagram especially. We're really dedicating that account, that MHH account, to that purpose alone. It's shouting out the superstars. Uh, Kathy Lund, also one of our superstars, showing some love. Appreciate you. Thank you, Kathy. Friend. She says, sorry I'm late. Much love to the Broncos fam. Hashtag state of being. Also up there in the Pacific Northwest. Great to see you, Kathy. Appreciate you. All right, let's see what else we got here in the chat stream. Charlie wants to know, is there going to be any training camp video or will we see nothing of the team until the Titans game? Right now, they have been releasing clips and the ones that are worthy of, you know, I, that we believe are worthy of your attention. We grab and, and put them as an article on MHH or in the community section at, at milehighhuddle.com. But right now, Zach, as you pointed to, until whatever it is, August 17th, when the when they pass through the conditioning phase that was pre-negotiated before training camp started, the new CBA amendment, and they actually get to the point where these coaches can put them in pads and start running 11 on 11, start having some contact. Until that happens, it's all fluff anyway. It's all walkthrough yeah. footage. It's all conditioning footage. It's all throwing against air footage, which is better than nothing. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I think you're going to see teams around the NFL, including the Broncos, really ramp up their PR and their media and focus on camp once there's a little bit more of a product that looks like real football happening out on the grass. Yeah, Chad, after the last four or five months, inject any highlights straight into my veins. I, I just yep. I can't get enough of it right now. And it will be more normal as time goes on, especially after the 17th gets here. But if you want any highlights for now, like Chad mentioned, the Broncos Twitter account is always posting Drew Locke videos and, and highlights from training camp practices. It's a little more guarded this year with all the CV protocols in place, but we're still getting a trickle of videos, of pictures, of news, and that will only ramp up a, as the weeks go on here. And by the way, gang, when you see something interesting out there, whether – and Steve Baumgartner, for example, is good at bringing stuff that he finds on the internet that's Bronco-related to our attention on Twitter. But if you find something you think is interesting that the community should see, that's what the community section at milehighhuddle.com is for. You go there, you throw a few words in, you paste the link or you paste the tweet – link and you go about your business and then we see that we can share it out there and it can, and everyone else sees it as well and draw attention to that. So that's why we encourage you to continue to utilize the community section for that purpose. David Kilgore, one of our super chat superstars, rocking the football priest hat, rocking the face mask, MHH, like a boss. He says, jumping in on super chat. Thank Appreciate you, your generosity, David, as always. Do you guys think Denver would like to have Russell Okung back? Would be an upgrade. You think? I mean, yeah. yeah, it would definitely be an upgrade in terms of proven and what the Broncos have. In a perfect world, sure, you would want him back, but how realistic is that? And he's been injured lately, right, Zach? Yeah, he had a, a pulmonary embolism. Don't quote me on that. He had something with blood clots in his lungs, and he's considering retirement instead of playing this season. He didn't opt out, but he's always had an injury history. He's he self-negotiated his contracts. He's kind of been a locker room lawyer. He was a really, really good tackle. But saying he's an upgrade over a player who's not playing this season is like saying my chair is an upgrade, Chad. I mean, anything they can put at right tackle over Juwan James, who's not on the roster for 2020, would be an upgrade. But I thought he was a good player, but not really an overly great player. And I'm not wishing that he returns right now. I'm happy with Tamar Dotson. So here's what's here's the latest on Oku. And thank you for refreshing my memory on that. Last year, 2019 offseason, Okung suffered a pulmonary embolism right. due to okay. blood clots in his lungs, was placed on the reserve non-football illness list to start the season, and then was activated off the NFI about halfway through the season, October 26th. And then on March 4th of this year, the Chargers traded Okung to Carolina for Trey Turner. And so, I mean, in a perfect world, yeah, I think he could be an upgrade, but you just don't know what you're getting from him from a health perspective. Great leader. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised to see him go on to have some kind of, if he stays playing football, some kind of a larger role with the NFLPA because he's smart, savvy business guy and and very outspoken as a leader, even though didn't quite rub Aqib Tlaib the right way back in the day, <laughs> we can all remember. Uh, but nevertheless, thank you, David. Yeah. Uh, Jeff C. jumping in, one of our superstars, showing thank some you, love. Jeff. He says, appreciate that, by the way, Jeff. He says, do we see a long bomb pass to oh, Judy yeah. this year? Oh, of course. Yeah. You'll Week see one, him. First quarter. Not, I really we're not going to wait. Yeah. I mean, 
Judy might not be the KJ Hamler speed demon, but the dude runs a four four five forty. His and route running can get him open. He's going to get that separation, and yeah. so all it's going to take is for Locke to have that, you know, a killer instinct. And I think you'll see some deep shots, of course, to to Jerry Judy. That is going to happen. I, I would not be surprised to see the Broncos make it a point in Week One to come out and take deep shots and establish themselves to the NFL. Like, hey, we're a passing offense too. We have a dynamic quarterback. We have a great receiving core. We're going to stretch you out vertically and be prepared for that. So Jerry Judy will. I don't know if he's going to catch it. I don't know if he's going to go for a touchdown or not, but he will get a deep ball attempt, I believe, early on in week one. We got Glenn Hauser showing some love, bona fide superstar, the man with the most awesome man cave, Bronco man cave. Appreciate you, Glenn. He says, I called the offensive line coach's office, and the receptionist said, please hold. (laughs) (laughs) Hashtag state of being. Hashtag freak handle. Hashtag let them hate. Hashtag poutine. Now, I don't know where the poutine's coming from. In fact, I don't know if you if that came on Thursday night, Zach, when you were back. It might have yeah, been earlier in the week. I was remember, it, yeah, you asked what poutine was, and we got yeah, a little refresher. I don't know what it is, but I mean, <laughs> they told me what it, what it is. You guys told me, but um, all right. But yeah, thank you, Glenn. We appreciate you, my friend. And we have a question here from Haha. I'll just say on YouTube. Do you guys think Michael Ojemudia will start, Zach? What do you think? Maybe eventually. Uh, I think to start out, though, you're going to see uh, A.J. Boye on the outside and uh, Devontae Bosby on the outside with Bryce Callahan in the slot. Not to say that Ojemudia cannot start this season, but he really has to work his way up. He, he's still kind of raw. He's obviously a rookie. He has a lot to learn. And I think the Broncos have more dependable veteran guys in that secondary they can count on and not have to force Ojemudia to start either. They can kind of work him in slowly on their terms. I'm a big Bosby guy. Maybe that's what my bias stems from, but I believe he's going to start on the outside opposite Boye. I am a little bit more optimistic about Ojemudia as a rookie, I think, than Zach is. When they made that pick, I felt like he would be a dark horse to challenge, even though on paper it's obvious that the three guys with the experience are Boye, Callahan, and Bosby, even though Bosby's experience is extremely limited. But he's been in the NFL for many years. He's only got a couple of starts under his belt, but he's been in the NFL soaking up NFL schemes, NFL film, NFL offenses for a lot longer than his contemporaries anyway. I think it'll come down to, you know, on base defense, it's going to be Bouye and Callahan, but when they go into nickel, which is going to be 80% of the time, who is that next corner to step on the field? Who's the Bradley Roby? I think it's going to be either Ojemudi or Bosby. And at this stage, honestly, it might lead a little bit I'd lean a little bit, I should say, to Bosby because of his experience. But to me, it's almost a flip a coin. Let the chips fall. We'll see. But I think it will be one of those two. As a th- uh, Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, as a third-round pick, though, he, he he's almost expected eventually to take that starting job, Chad. If he can't beat out as a third-round pick Devontae Bosby, then he's another Langley or Yadam. You have to see a pretty quick development from a third-round cornerback. Derek Green jumping in, showing some love. One of our Thank superstars. You, Appreciate you. And uh, I think you should have should have got that um, for – yeah, you should have got your shirt by now, I think, Derek, for the misses. So let me know. And when you get that, tell her to send us a selfie. Appreciate that. And he says, of course, by the way, work's been crazy. Just showing my support uh, always. And appreciate we always you, appreciate that, Derek. Yep. You and Adina, we appreciate you. Um and tell her to send us the uh, send us the selfie. All right, stream just did a quick jump on me. Let me scroll back up. Bear with me one second here, gang. And for what it's worth, John, the stream just jumped. The next superstar I have here in the stream that is accessible is Jerry. So if you let me know if I need to go into YouTube. Uh, but we got Jerry rocking the MHH mask, his new profile pic. And for those of you who can't quite make it out, this went up on Instagram today, by the way, Mile High Huddle Instagram. But if you can't quite make it out in the background there, taking some cues from the great Glenn Hauser, Jerry's got the Huddle Up podcast, a live stream on the screen, and we love it, dude. You're a good That's man. Awesome. He's also very uh, uh, caring about his fellow Broncos fans and members of this community at MHH, and that's all I'll say, but he's a, he's a great dude. Jerry says, sneaking over from Facebook to drop some love. By the way, he's also a supporter on Facebook is Jerry. And so that means a lot to us. Appreciate you, Jerry. 
sneaking over from Facebook, drops some love, uh, some love. Would love to get the let them hate jersey, but the wife will not authorize until a black and blue and orange one may be released. Love you guys always. <laughs> black, blue, and orange one will be released. Love you guys always. Interpret that. What does he mean by that? I don't know. I think it, he means it literally, like he wants a black, a black, blue, and orange color scheme. I'm not sure, Jerry. Let us know what you mean by that. We can kind of experiment with the variations of the shirt, but if your wife won't let you, maybe you can convince her. Yeah, I'm Pretty not cool sure. Shirt. I think he's, I think he's, he's joking. He's, it's some kind of tongue in cheek. But I'm, you know, I'm slow on the uptake sometimes on on the subtleties that exist sometimes in the chat. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Though, love you yeah. too. Really appreciate you, my dog. Um, all right, bear with me one second here. My, uh, I've got my dog sitting here next to me. This is I'm really walking the razor's edge of risk because I just had him fixed, and he he requires my uh, observation and being close to me right now because he's wearing the cone of shame. Those of you who are also <laughs> pet owners, oh, here, I'll show poor you. guy. Here, Bucky. This is Bucky. You guys have seen him on the show before. Oh, look at the cone. Oh, he looks so uh, sad. He is sad, dude. He was pissed off at me when he's tired. Oh, look how cute he is, though. When I picked him up from the vet, he was displeased. Let me just put it that way. Oh. What'd you do to me? So, <laughs> Soon enough, Buck. You don't have to worry about it. You'll be out of there. Anyway, if you see Back me to- look over a little bit, that's what I'm doing here. Back to chewing on yourself. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right. Let's see what else we've got here in the chat stream. Um, let's see. Good to see you. Whoops. Sorry. Grab that again, John. Just saying hi to Adon here. Mark Anthony says every aspect of our offense looks strong other than tackles. I've seen teams fall apart because of it. Do y'all feel the same? Mark, it's a fair question. It's a fair concern. But Zach, considering the fact that Drew Locke was number one among qualifying quarterbacks with at least 150 dropbacks last year in terms of evading the sack, I'm not as worried. Is it a concern? Yes, but you bring DeMar Dotson in. It helps bridge the gap quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, I was resigning myself after James opted out to having Wilkinson and Garrett Bowles be the tackles. And even then, with Locke's escapability, his natural playmaking talent, I was not overly concerned. But the signing of DeMar Dotson or the potential signing really quells my my worries about the Broncos offense. The tackles aren't great. They they still need, I think, another couple guys behind uh, their locked-in starters. But it's a lot worse than uh, what it could have been. We have a really good question here, but I hate it. And it's coming from the... Um, Mile High Huddle Super Fan Facebook group. And so I'm hopping in to see – it's from Sean Miller. Okay, so Sean, you, you're you going to have to give um, StreamYard permission to show your name in future if you're going to watch from the from the MHH group. But Sean wants to know what happens if the draft uh, – with the draft if college football gets pushed back till spring. Zach, we don't know the answer to that. We are 100% in uncharted yeah. waters with regard to implications – ramifications on the NFL draft. I I don't even think Goodell knows right now. The NCAA doesn't know. I mean, this is a thing that they're really taking day by day and playing it by year. I would think that a lot of guys would declare early and you'd have a pool of of no doubt prospects you can choose from. Maybe the supplemental draft would be more, uh, you know, involved next year. I don't know how it's going to work, Chad. That's something that we have to wait and see for it to come out. Yeah. But like I said before, if there is no college football season this this fall, it really is going to put a damper and a dent in our colleagues that are in the draft content coverage business. And I really feel for them. And uh, well, I mean, even our own guys who, who do so much with the draft here at MHH, it's going to be, it's going to be just a unique year. We'll see. We don't know yet how it's going to shake out. The wizard jumps back in showing some great extreme generosity as always. We much love to you, my brother. He says, the more I think about it, and by the way, hope everything, it's, it's, I don't want to say everything went well because how can you say anything goes well when you are mourning the loss of a loved one at a funeral, but not, but I hope everyone's doing okay in your family, my friend. He says, the more I think about it, the more I'm convinced that Juwan James created the naughty, naughty thing <laughs> just so that he had a legit reason <laughs> to not have to play this well, season. He's always like a mad scientist, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Mundungus took the red pill for sure. <laughs> yeah, sounds like it. But but listen, in all seriousness, Mike, um, you know, you got to question the heart. This is something that I t- yeah. I've talked about before 
on this pod. I talked about it on the uh, That's Good Sports podcast with Brandon and Will. You worry about where this dude's heart is. How much does he really love football? How much does he really want to play football? We have to question these things at this stage, both in media and the fans. I think the team, look, none of the players, they're close, they close ranks around each other. No one's going to talk smack about them. The closest anyone has come to saying anything that could even be remotely perceived as negative was Elijah Wilkinson saying he was surprised that Juwan James decided to opt out. Like that came out of nowhere to him. He was really surprised. But that's not, not – you can't really even say that's negative. I mean, it, hard time interpreting that as negative. But nevertheless, the players, they're not going to say it publicly, Zach. But, of course, they're out there risking themselves. If if they are – if the, whatever risk exists, they're out there exposing themselves to it for the purpose of, yes, making a paycheck. But also, I'm sure a lot of them have the altruistic mindset in terms of we're – we're making ourselves available, available for the team. Uh, Dalton Reisner, Zach, when we talk about altruism, is this was something he said on Thursday. We can pull the quote. I can grab it if we need to. But to paraphrase him, he talked about the fact that this country needs football back. We've, yes. Everyone's been scarred and just hard-driven, put away wet, damaged, PTSD from 2020, what 2020 has been. The country needs football, and he's not wrong. And in that same altruistic sense, a lot of these players, it might not be the number one reason they're showing up to work every day, Zach, but it factors into what they're doing. And Juwan James just – he opted out of that. He, he's like, whatever, you guys figure this out. I'm out. I was going to say I'm glad you brought it up that you, not necessarily you, but you are crazy if you think the Broncos players aren't privately criticizing Juwan James or privately complaining the fact that he opted out. Von Miller got CV. He's playing this year. He has also breathing issues, and he could have opted out. He'd been a high-risk guy, and no one would have had an eyelash if he would have cited his medical history. Uh, Kareem Jackson had CV. He's playing this year. Juwan James got a record-setting contract. He played 63 snaps, and his teammates were thinking – I'm in the foxhole. I'm I'm sweating. I'm bleeding. I'm I'm shedding tears for this team. And you can't come out here with us. You're going to opt out. My biggest worry, and this is what I was worried about last year, is Juwan James is the type of guy he got paid and he's checked out. That's it for him. It's Albert Hainsworth syndrome, and that's what I think Juwan James has. And uh, the Broncos players, Chad, they're human beings as well. They're not just good teammates outwardly, privately. I would not be shocked if they have a giant group text message going and they're just bashing Juwan James for not playing this year. I agree. We don't know that. We haven't. Necess- we're not reporting that. <clears throat> we are no. speculating on that. Football. And I, and I agree that I would not be surprised. Uh, Terry, jumping back in. Appreciate you, my brother. Fries, gravy, and cheese curds. Poutine, I guess, is what he's talking about. Here, Sounds right? pretty good. All right. So appreciate you, dog. Uh, Duke jumping back in. Appreciate you, my friend. Thank you, Duke. Today, giving away Andy Janovich looks silly now. <clears throat> Janovich helped that depleted O line, and the O line appreciated his help. Maybe I mean I get what you're saying. Um, how much you can overvalue a fullback, though, no matter what the environment is, unless you are. Um, oh, I just had a brain fart, dude. The dude in San Francisco that came from the Ravens. What's his name? You know the fullback. Uh, all pro. Oh, juice check. Yes. Thank you. Kyle, juice check. Kyle, you set juice check, whatever. Yeah. Unless you're that guy, unless you're all world fullback, I'm not sure that the impact is going to be felt all that much, or at least that it's not one Duke that a guy like Andrew Beck or right. any of the other guys that play tight end that are six foot three and, and above and 250 pounds can't step in and help a little bit. But yeah, if you're worried about right tackle and you're Pat Shermer, that's one thing you can do is you can, shade some help that way. You can put a tight end next to him. You can put a fullback there to chip. You can do the same on the left tackle if you're worried about Garrett Bowles. We'll see. This is another example, though, Zach, of why the Broncos really need Garrett Bowles to have turned the corner last year, that that needs to have been a real development, a real aha eureka moment because they can't afford to help him. The help's got to go on the right side if there's going to be help in terms of the tackles. 
it, the fullback is really a dying position in the NFL, and the Broncos got a draft pick for trading that guy away. We all love Janovich, great team player, good fullback, good on specials, but you know they can get by with Andrew Beck. And if they're worried about blocking, like I mentioned earlier, that's why they signed Nick Vanette to be a blocker. They, they have ways of finessing uh, running downs and running formations to be successful if they're worried about a weak link on the offense. Andrew Beck can be just as impactful because he plays tight end in line, and also he can play fullback in the backfield. So I'm not sweating the general loss. We got Christy, <clears throat> excuse me, the queen of MHH, jumping in and showing some love as she is wont to do. She says, I appreciate you, Christy. Yeah, she says, with you. this little upgrade on the line, do you think that will work for or against Bowles? Might make him look worse or mm -hmm. he might feel the pressure. Good question. Be better. And on top of that, Zach, and I'm going to serve this over to you, if Dotson is brought in to plug and play at right tackle, we'll see. So far, the word is he's going to compete with Wilkinson. But yeah, if you plug compete. and play at right tackle, Wilkinson suddenly Bowles is back into a fight for left tackle. You know what? If Bowles is this new, changed, motivated guy, like he's he kind of like positioning himself on Twitter with the Mamba mentality, then he will see the fact that Broncos signed a tackle off the street and replaced their current right tackle, the in-house guy. He should see it's that easy for somebody else to take his job. So if he wants another contract with Denver, if he wants a future in Denver, or if he wants a future in the NFL, this should make him better. He should take motivation and inspiration from the DeMar Dotson signing. But that's the thing with Garrett Bowles. We don't know what we're getting. We don't know if he's going to go into a shell, if he's going to feel slighted, if he's not going to have any effect. But I would think, Chad, the way my mind works, I'm competing for my, my professional life on the team. My counterpart on the right side just got replaced by a street free agent. What does that say about me? I'm nothing special either. I can be replaced as well. So I like to think that DeM DeMar Dotson's acquisition would push Garrett Bowles and make him better. But we never really know with Garrett Bowles, do we? Well said. We got Mark Langley as we've crossed the one-hour mark. we got to start wrapping things up. But Mark Langley jumps in, showing some Thank love. You, Appreciate you, dog. What's up, my guys? And what's up, Broncos country? And then I just noticed we missed one from the Wizard who uh, jumped back in to say with authority, 11 and 5 or 12 and 4. The Wizard <laughs> has spoken. Enough said. Love it, dog. Appreciate you, my friend. Um, John, do you have Mike at – Evans on on yours. If not, I'll I'll do it the old fashioned way here, and grab it from YouTube and do one of these. The same thing I just did. Bear with me, gang. Sorry for the dead air, but sometimes we just do not leave our superstars out in the cold when the chat stream jumps them. We'll we'll grab Kevin next. Mike Evans jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. Very Thank generous. You. Fifteen dollars super chat. He says I'm feeling better about the O line with the new addition. Appreciate y'all. We appreciate you, Mike. And unfortunately, we can't show that great profile pic of yours sporting the Huddle Up podcast, football priest t-shirt, and you've got the stadium in the background. It's a, it's one of the most unique, and, and we love seeing it. All right, let's. Uh, we do feel better. I mean, it's it's a step in the right direction. Does it bring you back to where you were when James was an active player and healthy on this roster? Maybe not. Although I'm not convinced it's that it's going to be that far of a that much of a departure going from James to Dotson, because again, James, you know, he's got five years and 63 snaps under his belt in the NFL. Dotson's an eight year starter at right tackle. So uh, Kevin Peterson showing some love, got his profile pick in there with one of the coolest Broncos, Dalton Reisner, who by the way says Lloyd Cushenberry's the man Zach, because he is very smart and all that very impressive, but he's keeping the O line room stocked with snacks and dip for those of you who need a translation, chewing tobacco. So he knows how to find the hearts and, and the stomachs of his fellow O-linemen. And so, by the way, KP says, imagine we had James on the roster with the no media talk O-line of the old days. Hashtag opt out of your manhood. For those of you who aren't sure what KP's talking about, when Tommy Nalen was running the Broncos offensive line, they had a policy that actually went against NFLPA slash NFL rules. They would not talk to media, period, end of story. So, yeah, it was a different time, bygone era. And he says, idea for the next shirt in the merch store, hashtag Raiders suck. Appreciate that, KP. We'll, keep, we'll, we'll take it under consideration. We'll take it under consideration. God, that hashtag is so savage. <laughs> that is manhood. Love it. Oh, man. um, oops, there we go. 
All right, let me just double check on the back end here. Make sure we got Christy, we got Mark, we got KP. Uh, let me see here. Bear with me one second. We got Jerry. We got Mike. Jerry. Oh, did it show Jerry twice? Nope. Jerry once. All right. And then we got Duke. We're good. I think we're up to date, gang. We got to get out of here for now, though. We're a little bit long. It's time to give away the Let Him Hate shirt. And let me see here from what John run it through the old internet machine. It looks like it is going to be here. Let's see. Where's the, I got the drum roll. Drum roll. Here we go. It is. You got it, John. Bear with us. Keep, keep that roll going, dude. Let me see your double stroke roll. Okay. Um, it is the suspense. Oh, here it is. It's Josh Alstrom. Josh, there here's it is. Dinner, dog. Josh, here's what you do. You email us, milehighhuddle at gmail.com. You provide us your T-shirt size and your address, and we will ship you out your Let Them Hate T-shirt. Yeah, John's wondering. We did get – we did grab – um well, let me double check. Mundungus is last. I think I went back and grabbed it so we didn't miss. Yes, we did get it. We did get him. He's he, We're caught up with, with Mikey boy. All right. So, Josh, hopefully you understand that. Reach out, email, yeah. give us your personal deets. Let us know what your T-shirt size is. We'll get you that. Congrats on winning. And also, for, this is for our friend and superstar, big-time member of the community. I don't see him in the stream tonight. But to Ed Keating, I have not shipped your hat out. You can see it right behind me. I totally spaced it last week. That's on me, dog. I'm going to get it in the mail tomorrow. So your hat is going to be on the way tomorrow. I have your address and everything. I just, I just totally forgot to do it. My fault. So that's coming in the mail. Look for it. I'm guessing even though you're on the East Coast, you'll probably have it by the end of the week. And then when you get that, dog, you know the drill. You send us a selfie. We want to shout you out. We want to show you some love on social media. But, Zach, I think that does it for tonight. Maybe by the time we reconvene tomorrow, there will be some additional news on the DeMar Dotson front. Let's not forget, he's not signed quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> I the wizard uh, with authority jumping in late <laughs> here at the 11th hour. Oh, man. Juwan James, hashtag eyebrow opt out. I, I, I didn't think it's possible for Broncos fans to hate anyone more than Garrett Bowles, but Juwan James, the vitriol for, for Juwan James is just uh, is crazy. I'm trying to remember if it was Mundungus. I don't think it was, though, who reached out to me. It was a, on a DM last week on Twitter that said, you c never trust a man with no eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I joke, took you know, that question Thursday. We have to maintain a professional posture. We, you know, we, we cover this team. And in these conversations with you guys live, sometimes, you know, we let our guard down and you see our personalities and we laugh and we joke. We do have to maintain a professional posture, <laughs> but these things are funny. What can we tell you? The yeah. community brings the funny, and, and Mike, thank you, dog. You help make us laugh. Mark's great at making us laugh. KP, <laughs> Glenn, all you guys, we love you. But we do got to get out of here for tonight. So make sure, ladies and gentlemen, you're following the podcast on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. Also follow the main account, at MileHighHuddle on Twitter. Follow my partner and fellow football priest, Zach Kelberman at Kelberman NFL, myself at Chad and Jensen. And then stay tuned because we'll be back in the saddle tomorrow night, 6 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. Eastern. We'll see what happens then. In the meantime, Zach, have a great start to your week, my brother. You as well. And I'm looking forward to another fresh week of podcasting, Chad. I anticipate DeMar Dawson being signed, so that'll be exciting this week. And John, follow him as well on Twitter at John K M H H. John is going to be doing more and more for us at MHH. So We'll look forward to revealing some of that stuff in the very near future, but that's it. We got to get out of here for tonight. Thanks to each and every one of you for joining us. Mile high salute to the super chat superstars. Much love. We got to get out of here for Zach Kelberman. I'm Chad Jensen. We'll see you tomorrow.